Well, good morning, my dear beloved brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ and our dear young people. This morning, we'd like to spend a little bit of time in thinking about the word righteousness. And we're not going to go into an in-depth study of the word. Um, and probably the passages I choose, you'll think of many others, and, and that's a good thing. So we, to start with, let's ask the question, what does it mean to be righteous? We may ask, how can we be righteous? In, the, in our last readings this week, we see righteousness or righteous appears 43 times in the book of Romans. The next closest is Matthew and it occurs 19 times. So we see that Romans has for us quite a focus on righteousness and righteous. Let's turn to begin with though to Matthew 25 verse 46. And there we read, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So we see here that righteous is associated with eternal life. 1 Peter 3, verse 12. We see a, another association being brought to our attention. 1 Peter 3, reading from verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So we see here the special consideration of the righteous, that God cares for the righteous. He hears their prayers. So we see that righteousness and righteous is an important attribute that indeed we want to have a part of ourselves. But after reading these verses, it's interesting by going to Romans 3, verse 10, Paul's perspective. And it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So we see if we, if we stop just there, indeed, our, our hearts are broken because we tend to feel that we would feel that we can't be righteous, so therefore uh, eternal life and God's care for us is, is not available. And we're certainly thankful that that is not the case. If we go to Vines and look, look up the word righteousness, referring to God, it says the following. It means essentially the same as his faithfulness or truthfulness that which is consistent with his own nature and promises. So the suggestion we see is that it entails everything that God is, for God is righteous. So con to continue, let's turn to Romans 1, verses 16 and 17. And here we read, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, and to every one that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed, from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So we ask the question, on what basis is God's righteousness revealed? And we're told here it is from faith to faith. We could sort of say that it's faith built upon faith, the idea that of, of faith growing. And then we're told that the just, or righteous, shall live by faith. So we see here that there, there's a standard that, that those who strive to be righteous should live by faith. And it's through faith that we come to understand God's righteousness. 
his character, and his working in each one of us. Now, it's interesting to go to uh, Philippians 3, verse 9 and 10. We'd almost say that this is a parallel, this is parallel to what we've just read. And it just gives us a, a little wider uh, perspective or understanding. And I keep flipping until I find Philippians. So here we are, Philippians 3, verses 9 and 10. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. So we see the, the verses that we read in Romans chapter one are, are repeated here, but they're, they're in a different order and a different layout. And Paul makes it clear that he doesn't have his own righteousness. So he is recognizing that he himself is not righteous. But it is that which is through the faith of Christ. And he continues, the righteousness of God by faith. Now remember in Romans, we read from faith to faith. So would this not be the same from the faith of Christ to the righteousness of God by faith. So we see a, a, an opening up, a, a wider explanation of what is being spoken of here. And he continues and says, that I may know him and the power of the resurrection. So this idea of knowing him is, is, is not an academic knowledge. It's not just, just reading of him or hearing of him. It is, it is applying it. it. It is a part of him. He's, he's known by experience and the power of his resurrection. But what did it say in uh, Romans 1 verse 16? It was the power of salvation. So we see here, it's essentially saying the same thing, that, that it is the, he's come to know him and this faith, is the power of the resurrection. Righteousness is not of man's achieving, but of God's giving. I'll read that again. Righteousness is not of man's achieving, but of God's giving. The idea of righteousness is to be made right with God. Now, if we turn to James 2, verse 21, we see here that James looks at things from uh, a slightly different angle. And we're not going to spend a lot of time uh, in James going through this, but it's just, um, just to stop and make us think. James 2, verse 21 says, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar? And if we read through this whole chapter, we, we get a better sense of, of what he is actually saying. But, and it's easy for us to get confused of whether righteousness is by faith or is it by works. But let's turn to Hebrews 11 where we have here the example of Abraham. Hebrews 11, verses 17 to 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac, shall thy seed be called. 
accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. So we need to ask ourselves, on what basis did Abraham offer Isaac? Would he have offered Isaac if he didn't have faith? You see, the foundation of Abraham's work or his acts was faith. It was the motivating force. He couldn't do it without it. Faith came first. Now, Isaac was the son of promise. He was the cherished child of Abraham and Sarah. Abraham was like you and I. He struggled. He had moments of doubt. But it was his faith that pulled him through. His trust and confidence in the Father. And this was the motivating force that enabled him to offer Isaac because he trusted. He trusted in the Father that God would be able to raise Isaac again because God had promised that Isaac would be his seed and from there would be Christ. So it's critical that we we understand here the power of faith. Well, what did, what did Paul tell us in Romans 1, 16? If we go back to Romans 1, 16, I know we're all familiar with it. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And what was that power? That was the f having faith in God. It enabled Abraham to do something he couldn't do otherwise. He trusted in his father. This is the power of salvation. It is the gospel of Christ, to have faith in Christ and in God's righteousness. And that is what we strive for, isn't it? We, we strive to to have this faith built up in us, us, so that in doing so, we are made righteous through our Heavenly Father. So we see that the power, it is our faith, our trust and confidence in God. It's not about willpower but the power of his word through faith in us. It's so important for us to keep that in, in order and in our minds because all the willpower in the world is of no value whatsoever unless it is based on faith. And those things our Heavenly Father has done for us through his Son. Let's turn to Romans 4, verses 3 to 8. And here we read, For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So we see in, in verse 3 
that it is through belief, it is through faith we are counted righteous. We are, we are put in a right relationship before the Father. Verse 4, if, we were, if it were through works that we were made righteous, then it would be as wages paid. It wouldn't be by grace. It would be as if we earn our place. And we know that that is definitely not the case. Once again, verse 5, it is through faith. Our faith in Christ, our faith in our Heavenly Father, that we are counted righteous. Verse 6 talks about the blessings upon those that God counts righteous. And verses 7 and 8, which is so important, that it is through faith we have forgiveness of sins. Indeed, we have to trust in him that we do have forgiveness. And that forgiveness gives us peace. It gives us comfort, doesn't brothers and sisters and young people? Well, then what about good works? We are certainly thankful that in our ecclesia, there's many who have a zeal for good works. There's two passages we'd like to focus on on this. Hebrews 10, verse 22 is the first one. Hebrews 10, verses 22 to 25. And it says here, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, forsaken, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as ye see the day approaching. So we see here the encouragement, and it's about fellowship. It's about drawing near one to another. And that coming together is based on faith. And it is that faith, the very foundation on which we are to encourage one another to good works. So we see here how good works is associated with the ecclesia and the work of the ecclesia and the fellowship one with another and the faith that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is upon the basis of that faith we are to encourage one another to do good works. Let's turn to Galatians 6, verses 9 and 10. Galatians 6, verse 9 and 10. And we read there, And let us, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So we see the encouragement here. And the emphasis is the household of faith has to come first. The principle is in all things that we do, it should be by faith to God's glory and not ours. So whether it's good works in the ecclesia, whether it's good works outside of the ecclesia, it must be based on faith to the glory of our Father. Otherwise, in his sight, it is not considered a good work. 
Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Now, essentially this passage is telling us, no matter what we do, that there's one focus that should be in our minds, and that's our Heavenly Father. And, and look how in, in these verses... It deals with simple things. Therefore, whether ye eat or drink. So is it just talking about eating or drinking? No, but it's talking about everyday things. That absolutely everything in our life, our mindset, that we must do it in faith to God's glory. So, I guess that means when we're maybe driving the car or maybe when we're doing grocery shopping or maybe when we're cutting the grass or maybe when we turn on the TV or maybe when we're looking at the internet, our minds must be Godward. That is essentially what we're being told here in Corinthians, that our minds must be continually Godward in all we do, no matter how great, whether we're doing great works or we're doing everyday things, the common things in life, like eating and drinking. We'd like to conclude with looking at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Verses 1 and 2. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into his, this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So we see that we are justified. We are made righteous, brothers and sisters and young people. How? Through the forgiveness of sins. We have access by faith into his grace. And we recognize that this morning, don't we? As we, we come together in prayer and praises and thanksgiving, that we are so blessed that we have access, we, we trust, we believe, we have faith that he is in our presence and that we are able to approach unto him, that we're able to ask for forgiveness of sins. And this is all made possible through our Lord Jesus Christ, through the work our Father has done through him. And what does it conclude in these verses in? That we need to rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Indeed, brothers and sisters, this is not a time to be solemn, but this is a time to rejoice in what the Father has done for us through his Son. As we look forward to that time of, of hope, when his son shall return to set up his glorious kingdom, that we can, we can, after we are finished, we can take comfort that we are made righteous, not of ourselves, but through the forgiveness of sins. And that gives us hope. That gives us the ability to praise him and to look forward to the wonderful time in which, as we wait for his son to soon return. So let us, dear brethren and sisters, let us rejoice in the hope that we share together. Thank you.